Welcome everyone. Welcome to Your Body in Balance, a question and answer with Dr. Neil Bernard that is brought to you today by the Lotus Health Foundation. Um, I'm Denise Siegel. I'm the CEO and curator of Living Healthy List, where we bring you honest, reliable information on health, wellness, personal development, and bringing a little bit more fun into life. And today I'm going to be your host and uh, moderator. So I'm really excited to have Dr. Neil Bernard with us uh, today. I've had the pleasure of uh, hearing him speak at a couple of different conferences throughout the years, uh, and actually had the, uh, the pleasure of uh, getting to meet him uh, at a, a few times as well. Uh, before we officially welcome Dr. Barnard, uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Barnard is an American doctor, an author, clinical researcher, and founding president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. As of 2015, he's an adjunct prof associate professor <laughs> at George Washington University <laughs> School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He is well known for advocating healthy eating, placing emphasis on a plant-based whole foods diet. He's the author of a number of books, including the one that we will talk about today, which is called Your Body in Balance. Dr. Barnard, thank you for being with us here today. Well, thank you. It's, it's an honor to be able to speak with you today. I appreciate that. Well, I know we're, uh, you're going to start today uh, with giving us a bit of a presentation, an overview of uh, what you share with, with the world. Mm -hmm. So I would love to just have you um, share your screen and take it over. Okay, let's do that. Okay, um, hopefully you can see that. Um, uh, what I wanted to talk about was maybe for the next half an hour or, or so, talk about the, uh, the main points in the book. And it sounds like somebody's not muted, and you might want to mute yourself. Okay, very good. Um, I was sitting at my desk one day, and the phone rang, and it was a young woman saying she had such bad menstrual cramps she couldn't get out of bed. Now, a lot of women have cramps, but for maybe one in 10, they are so severe that you're just really miserable, can't go to work, can't go to school, whatever. And that was her situation. Her name was Robin, and as she described what she went through month after month, it sounded like torture, and it really was. Um, and so I suggested something to her that was an educated guess. I don't think any doctor ever suggested something like this to a patient for menstrual pain. I suggested I could give her some painkillers for the next couple of days, but for the next four weeks, how about a diet change? no animal products, and keep oils very, very low. And she was a little skeptical, but she said, I'll give it a try. And the next month she called me back and said, this is miraculous. She had uh, no symptoms at all with her period. And the month after that, and the month after that. So I thought, well, that's good. Let's put it to the test. So with Georgetown University's Department of OBGYN, we brought in a group of women for a randomized clinical trial. They all had menstrual pain. Half of them started the diet. The other half took a supplement that was really a placebo, just a dummy pill. And after two cycles, two months, they switched and the diet people started the supplement and so and vice versa. And what we found is the diet worked for them too. We published the findings in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology and in a nutshell, pain intensity diminished, pain duration diminished, and so did PMS symptoms like bloating and water retention and moodiness before their periods. So in the course of this study, something else happened, is that we asked all of the participants not to use birth control pills or any other kinds of hormones because those would affect their pain and we wanted to make sure that we were just focusing on food alone. So we asked all the women if they were sexually active, if they could use some kind of contraception that's not the pill. Well, in the course of this, uh, one of the women uh, told me that she was infertile and didn't need birth control of any kind and hadn't used it for a long time because she and her husband had been evaluated as to why they weren't getting pregnant. And she said it was not him, it was her, and it was, she didn't ovulate. Well, the second month that she was on the healthy plant-based diet, she came into our research center and said, Dr. Barnard, I don't know how this happened, but I am pregnant. Anyway. I ran into her several years later. She had now had three kids. Um, so the first patient we described had menstrual pain, uh, what doctors would call dysmenorrhea. The second one had what doctors would call infertility. 
But how about if we take our eraser and just erase both of those diagnoses and say, maybe they were out of balance. And when you get back into balance, these symptoms can diminish or even go away. So I've been talking about hormones and hormonal conditions. What are hormones anyway? Well, hormones are like letters that go in the mail. They go from one part of your body to another part of your body, from your thyroid gland in your neck to your, to your cells of your body to give you energy, or from the ovaries to the uterus. Hormones are messengers. And if you don't have enough of them, then the message never gets through. But if you have too many, it's a problem too. You need the right amount of hormones, not too little, not too much. So let's go back to the first patient. She had menstrual pain and menstrual changes uh, relate to hormones. In this graph, as you can see at the beginning of a month, the woman doesn't have very much estrogen in her blood. That's the female sex hormone. But it rises over a two week period and then it, it hits a peak and then it falls. She's now ovulating. The ovary is really CNA. And then during the second half of the month, the amount of estrogen rises gradually again because the, the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month it's convinced we could get pregnant this month, we better get ready. So that rising estrogen amount thickens the, the inner lining of the uterus in anticipation of pregnancy. But then after about another week, the disappointed uterus discovers we are not pregnant again. And so estrogen falls and you lose the uterine lining in menstrual flow. So this whole curve can change. Let me show you what I mean by that. This is the uterus. And in the middle, you see that thin pink lining. That's the endometrium, the inner layer. Um, and every month that will swell up in anticipation of pregnancy. But what if I'm eating foods or doing something so that my estrogens get elevated? There's, there's too much estrogen in my blood. That, um, that endometrial layer can thicken too much. It produces prostaglandins that cause pain and you feel miserable month after month after month. Yikes. Well, how can foods help me to get back into balance? Well, to answer that question, let me bring in Catherine. Catherine was from Louisiana. She was in the Air Force and she was shipped over to Iraq in 2003. Now, you're in a war zone. You're working hard. You're eating what little food the government gives you and you don't gain any weight. And eventually her tour of duty came to an end and she went back to the United States and her friends took her out to eat. And they said, Catherine, what did you miss when you were over in Iraq? And she missed gumbo and shrimp and especially cheese, cheese more than anything, macaroni and cheese, cheese snacks. And in fact, a friend of hers for her birthday gave her an entire case of 48 packs of macaroni and cheese, which she ate for 48 days straight. I'm not making this up. Well, something happened. She started gaining weight, but she also developed a condition called endometriosis. That's where the cells that line the uterus sneak out through the fallopian tubes and they implant all around the abdomen, causing pain. She tried painkillers. She tried hormonal treatments. Uh, the doctor was working with her on all of these things and nothing was helping. And finally, the doctor said, well, you've got pain. You're probably infertile from the endometriosis. Let's just take your uterus out. She thought, well, wait a minute, I'm 27 years old. And she and her husband hadn't started their family yet. She wasn't too crazy about this idea. But the doctor said, you're probably infertile from the endometriosis, you got nothing to lose. Well, she had a lot of pain. She thought, I can't live this way. So she decided to go ahead and have the hysterectomy. She scheduled it for six weeks later, but before she could have the operation, a friend told her about the diet changes that Sim, diet changes similar to what we had uh, had been pioneering before, getting away from animal products, keeping oils low as a way to manipulate estrogen levels in the body. She decided to try the diet approach. And right away she started to feel better. She was losing weight and getting her energy back, but her pain also was going down. And it didn't go away 100%. There was still a little bit of pain left. So she thought, well, I may as well get the hysterectomy since I'm infertile. Um, so she showed up to have the procedure at the hospital. And the doctor opened her up. And about an hour later, she woke up in the recovery room. Her doctor was there and he said, Catherine, I need to tell you something. When I opened you up, I discovered that your endometriosis was gone. 
it's amazing. You have some scarring, a lot of scarring where it used to be, and you had some adhesions that were caused by the scarring, and that was the only reason you had some pain left. The endometriosis itself, it isn't there anymore. I don't know what happened. Her mother was in the waiting room with her and said, or in the recovery room with her, and her mother said, doctor, she went vegan. The doctor said, oh, stop it. Foods don't cause endometriosis, and there's no way a diet change is going to make it go away. If, if we're going to try to explain this, we just have to assume this is a miracle. Well, I don't know if it was a miracle. The truth of the matter is that foods can change your hormones. But I have to say, I want to praise that doctor for not having done the hysterectomy. He left her, his, her uterus in place, but he didn't know about how foods can affect endometriosis. By the way, Catherine lost a lot of weight. Um, and she was not infertile after all. Um, the doctor left her uterus in place and she has three children now of her own. Um, and she became one of our Food for Life instructors and now teaches other women how to take back their health. Okay, so I mentioned cheese. Catherine loved cheese. Does cheese have hormones? Sure it does. Cheese comes out of a cow as milk. Uh, cows are kept pregnant on dairy farms. They're impregnated every year. And during their nine month pregnancy, they make estrogens that, gets into, that get into the milk. And the cows are milked during their pregnancy. So bits of estrogen and progesterone are in milk that you drink or cheese or yogurt or ice cream that you might eat. There's no such thing as milk that does not have estrogens in it. Okay, this affects men too. Researchers in Rochester, New York uh, looked at men who ate uh, not too much cheese and who ate more cheese. It turned out that the sperm counts were higher for men who, who tended to eat little or no cheese. The men who ate a lot of cheese, between one and two and a half servings a day, had impaired sperm counts, were more likely to be infertile. Uh-huh. So there's something about dairy products and the estrogens that are in them that seem to affect the biology both of women and men. Do some other things affect our hormones? The answer is yes. Two other things that I want you to know about. One is just fat in general. Fatty foods, whether it's chicken, fish fat, beef, pork fat, or even added oils and fried foods, fats raise hormone levels in, a negative, in, in an unfortunate way, in an unhelpful way. So that women discover that if their menstrual pain goes away on a low-fat vegan diet, but then after a while they decide to tuck into fatty stuff, a lot of guacamole and fried things, their pain might come back. So keeping fat low helps. Fiber helps as well. A high fiber diet will help you. And let me show you why. This is the liver, that red thing there up the top. The liver filters your blood to remove estrogens and the estrogens go down into the intestinal tract. But the trick is to get that estrogen out of the body, you have to have high fiber foods. Fiber means beans and vegetables and fruits and whole grains. That fiber carries the estrogens away. So the liver pulls the estrogens out of the blood, they go into the intestine, and then fiber carries them out with the waste. You're literally flushing them away. But what if your lunch was salmon and your dinner was a steak or you're eating yogurt? Do these foods have fiber? No, because fiber is only in plants. Animal products don't have fiber. So if there's no fiber in your intestinal tract, your body reabsorbs the estrogens. The estrogens pass from the intestine back into the bloodstream and they circulate around and around and around again. What's the answer? If a person starts a vegan diet, vegan meaning no animal products, then every single mouthful of food you're eating has fiber and that carries the unwanted estrogens away and down they go. Very easy. Okay, I wanna make sure everyone's paying attention. Um, spam, does it have fiber or no fiber? Ah, no fiber? Okay, very good, got that right. Here's a trash can. The spam could go right down there. Okay, excellent. Uh, next quiz question, how about KFC? Fiber or no fiber? What do you think? Well, actually there is some fiber if you ate the carton. But other than that, not so good. So we're gonna dump that too. All right, goodbye. Um, how about, oh, some of these snack foods, they, they started out as plants, but factories made them unrecognizable. You're gonna to wanna to avoid that stuff too. Okay, so avoiding dairy, keeping oils really low and oily foods in general, 
and having high fiber plant foods, that helps me get my estrogens uh, level in, in uh, good, uh, good zone. Now, so far we've talked about menstrual pain, endometriosis, and fertility. All of these relate to hormones, but they're not gonna kill you. But when hormones are out of balance, they can cause some diseases that will kill you. This is a breast cell. And those little dots, those are estrogen molecules. Those little dark red dots are estrogens waiting to get in the cell. They pass right into the nucleus where they attach to the DNA. And once they're inside and attached to the DNA, they can damage the cell so that it becomes a cancer cell. And that one cancer cell splits to, into two, two become four, four become eight, eight become 16, and the cancer spreads. Am I saying that estrogen will cause cancer? That's exactly what I'm saying. Estrogen is the natural female sex hormone, but it has to be in balance. If you have too little, that's not good, but if you have too much, it can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, researchers combined the uh, results from nine prior studies and showed you here is the, the relationship between free estradiol in your blood and breast cancer risk. As you can see, the higher your estrogen level, the higher your cancer risk. Okay, um, I wanna shift gears now and I'd like to talk about insulin. Uh, insulin is a hormone, it's made in your pancreas and it goes to the cells of your body, not to get you ready for reproduction like estrogen or testosterone, but to help sugar get into cells. You remember what hormones do? Hormones are letters, they are instructions. They go to some other part of your body to tell them what to do. And insulin says, okay, cell, take glucose out of the blood, put it inside your cell and use that glucose for energy. Okay, in 2003, the National Institutes of Health funded my research team to test a new diet for type two diabetes. For comparison, we used a conventional diet. That meant cutting calories, limiting carbohydrate, but the, the diet that we were testing is a plant-based diet, meaning no animal products at all, keeping oils really low. And the test we use is hemoglobin A1C. You've heard of A1C, that's a test for blood sugar control. And if you have diabetes, you want it to be below seven or so. Now our participants were not below seven on average, they were around eight, uh, meaning not in such hot control. And the red line here, is the conventional diet. They did well, they had a drop of about, what's that, 0 0.4 absolute percentage points, something like that. But the blue line is the people on the plant-based diet, the vegan diet. They improved three times more. Okay, so how is it that a diet that increases beans and vegetables and fruits and so forth, foods that have carbohydrate, how is that so great for diabetes? Well, it is. This is Vance. Vance was a policeman in Washington, D.C., then he worked in a bank, and Vance had diabetes all up and down his family tree. And he himself was diagnosed at age 31. He was in his later 30s when he came in to see us. But he started the vegan diet. And first he said, you know, this is a really easy diet because prior diabetes diets that he had been on made him cut calories, limit carbohydrates, count his carb grams, made him feel guilty if he ever had an apple or an orange. And what we said to him is, no, you eat as much as you want. Don't count calories, don't count carb grams. If you wanna have fruit, go ahead. Uh, very easy, instead of meat chili, have bean chili. Instead of meat sauce on your pasta, have the tomato sauce, very simple. Over the course of a year, he lost 60 pounds. His doctor, his private doctor, stopped his medications and his A1C dropped from 9.5 which is terrible, to 5.3, which is normal. I have to tell you, when I first saw this 5.3 number, <clears throat> I had to pace around my office for quite a while because that means he didn't have diabetes anymore. And I had been taught in medical school that once you had diabetes, you always had diabetes. Well, I'm happy to say that now we've gotten used to it where we see so many people improve their diabetes to the point where they can reduce their medications, sometimes get off them completely, and that was Vance's situation. Now, don't get me wrong, Velveeta is waiting right around the corner, so the diabetes can come back if a person eats the diet that caused the diabetes in the first place. Okay, let me show you how this diet helps with diabetes. This is my most important slide, and let me ask you if you're doing something else, 
please watch the demonstration I'm about to give you because I want you to share this with your friends who don't understand what causes diabetes. This is really important. This purple oval you see, that's a cell, like a muscle cell in your body. Your cells run on a fuel, you, just like your car. Your car runs on gasoline, right? That gasoline is your car's fuel. Well, what do your muscle cells run on? They run on glucose. Glucose is a natural sugar that's in the blood and it gets into the cells and it gives them power. The problem is it's hard for that glucose to get into the cell. Mostly it just bounces off. It doesn't get inside at all until you have a key. And that key is called insulin. The insulin key is made in the pancreas. You remember hormones? They're made in one part of the body. They go in the blood to another part of the body. So the, the pancreas makes insulin, which is just like a key, and that little tiny key goes through the blood to the surface of the cell, and it's going to attach to that receptor. There's a receptor there, just like a key in a lock. And once the insulin key attaches to that receptor, now watch what happens. It opens up these little doorways on the cell to let the glucose inside. Okay, great. All right, so now I've got the fuel in the cell. I've got energy. My muscles can do their thing. So what could ever go wrong? Well, what if my dinner looks like that? What if my lunch looks like that? And my breakfast is kind of like that? And I'm eating a lot of fatty foods? Do, do these foods really have fat? Yeah, they sure do. A lot of it. So if I'm eating fat, what happens? Well, the fat gets into the cell. And as the fat builds up inside the cell, the key doesn't work anymore. It's like the lock is all gummed up. So the insulin key tries to open up the cell, but nothing happens. The glucose molecules just keep bouncing off. Now, by the way, doctors hate words like fat because it's only got three letters. So we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, but it's just fat inside a muscle cell. What's the answer to it? Well, what if I do what Vance did? What if I stop eating animal products? And what if I keep oils really low? Well, then the fat starts coming out of the cell. The, because I'm not eating animal fat and vegetable oils, the fat comes out of the cell. And when that happens, the insulin key can work again, and then the cells open up and the glucose can come inside. Phew, hooray. Okay, so the answer to diabetes, both preventing it and treating it, is to get the fat out of the cells by getting the fat off your plate. And that's why a vegan diet that has no animal products and no animal fat and a diet that is low in oil, those two steps can help you reverse your diabetes. So here's the point. The body can heal. You know this is true. If you cut your skin, the Band-Aid doesn't heal you. The Band-Aid just protects you. The skin cells have the program to heal. If you break your leg, the cast doesn't heal you. The cast just holds the bones still so that the bones themselves can heal. If you have narrowed arteries, they can heal. If you have diabetes, it can heal to a degree. But here's the issue. Let's say I pick at that cut. And let's say I don't have a good cast on my leg. The body is never gonna heal if I keep continuing the insult that caused the problem in the first place. So if the insult is I'm eating foods that don't have fiber in them, like meat, dairy products, eggs, I'm eating foods that have a lot of fat in them, I'm not giving the body what it needs, my body won't heal. I'll have lots of problems. The problems won't get better. But what if I change my diet in a major way? The body can start healing, and it's a wonderful thing. So I got excited about it, and that's why I wrote this book called Your Body in Balance. And my idea was to help people to understand how foods can affect hormones in a variety of ways. When I talk about hormones, I'm talking about menopausal symptoms, PCOS, endometriosis, cancer like prostate cancer that's uh, such a problem for men, breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, which are such problems for women, but also metabolic issues, thyroid conditions like hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. All of these things have strong relationships with food that you need to know about. Your mood, your skin, your hair, all of these are affected by hormones. So I got excited about it and I decided I wanted to let people know. Uh, Lindsay Nixon did the recipes uh, for this book. And I have to say, when she sent me the recipes, she said, 
Dr. Barnard, here are 65 recipes. I hope you like them. They're quick, they're easy to make. They are 100% vegan, they're healthy. I think they taste great, but I want you to know one other thing. She said, Dr. Barnard, the foods that you talk about in this book helped me to stop my menstrual pain too. So I, I'm gonna call that validation. So the old idea was just, all right, I eat bad foods and I get overweight or high cholesterol or diabetes or something like that. The new way of thinking about foods, of getting your body in balance, is that we're gonna select foods that control our hormones, whether it's estrogen or testosterone or thyroid hormone or insulin or the, foods, uh, the, the hormones that control our mood and our digestion. And if we do that, we've got a whole range of power that we never knew we had. And that's the idea to put that to work. Anyway, I hope you found this presentation useful. And the only other thing I would ask of you though, is don't just keep this information to yourself. We gotta change the world. There are so many people dealing with all these problems. You know what I'm talking about. There's a family where the kids are starting to gain weight. And the parents say, well, you're just, you're not exercising enough. You're on your, your uh, computer too much. Get outside and exercise. The problem might not have had anything to do with that. The problem might have been the frozen pizza that comes in every night with three eighths of an inch of yellow asphalt on top of it. And then uh, a, young, a young woman starts developing menstrual pain, a PCOS, other problems, and they think it's just fate or it's just genetics, never knowing how foods can affect them. If someone has cancer in the family, if they have diabetes and thyroid diseases, they end up with medical visits one after another after another. There is a role for medicine, certainly. Sometimes doctors play a life-saving role, but quite often the issue is the foods that we're putting into our body. We're not giving ourselves the things that we need to heal. So we need to learn about this together. Then we need to connect with each other. And finally, we need to share this information around. Whether we do that on social media, emailing things to our friends, Put, posting it on Instagram, whatever we do, we need to share this information. We need to be allowed. We need to get the information out there so that we can save people's lives. All right, let me stop at that point. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. That was really, really great. Uh, I really love how you bring such a uh, difficult topics down to a level where we can all understand uh, what you're talking about and how we can actually make changes. So I have a ton of questions, um, some, that, some that I know I sent to you uh, a couple of days ago, uh, okay. but others that, that have come uh, to me in the last uh, 24 hours. All right, I'm happy to do my best. Okay, great. Well, the first one comes from uh, actually a friend of mine who is a nephrologist here uh, at, in Rochester, Minnesota. And it's, it's about um, diabetes and type two diabetes to the point where people now have renal disease. Right. And, from my understanding, 30 to 40% of um, diabetics get renal disease or have renal disease. Um, but the diets that are recommended to them don't seem to be plant-based because they're high in potassium. So what, from your perspective, can you, can you explain that a little bit and how do, we get, how do people get around that? If okay. their doctor is telling them not to eat a plant-based diet, but we know that that's something that would really help them. Okay, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a terrific question and it's, it's, I, I'm delighted that a renal physician is, is thinking about this. Um, backing up a little bit, uh, diabetes is a huge contributor to kidney disease, uh, as is hypertension. And in fact, if you looked uh, up and down a dialysis ward and you think, how did you get here? It's diabetes and hypertension in case after case after case after case. If we could get diabetes under control, we just wouldn't have anywhere near the need for dialysis or renal transplant that we have today. Same with hypertension. Um, the kidneys are very delicate things. So people should, with diabetes, they should be on plant-based diets. See, there's no reason to have cholesterol or animal fat in their diet at all. Part of the reason uh, they need that is what I described earlier, is that to get the diabetes under better control, you need to get the fat out of the muscle and liver cells. That's what a plant-based diet does. Other reason is that if you look at what kills people, person on dialysis, what are they going to die of? They're going to die of heart disease, um, some kind of cardiovascular death. You want to baby that body to the extent that you can. You don't want to, you don't want to surrender to it. So, and you see this all the time where people will try a, a ketogenic diet and say, well, I'll eat steak and gravy. You think, good heavens, you know, as their low density lipoprotein cholesterol level goes up, you think, good heavens. 
over the long run, this is really risky. Um, so a plant-based diet is ideal. It's what you want to do. However, you, um, you've picked on an, an important issue, which is what, what happened when a, when, when a person is beyond um, all of these stages and their kidneys are totally shot and the kidneys can no longer manage potassium as well as they could before. What do I do now? Well, first of all, um, this is a time to make sure that you're working with a good renal uh, registered dietitian uh, because you really do want to plan the meals and the family's got to sit down together and really understand the foods to eat and the foods not to eat. But this is not a reason to avoid, avoid uh, uh, plant products and go back to animal products. Um, there are certain foods that are quite high in potassium and, that's, and, and this is what, what your friend is thinking of. Uh, typical vegetables, typical fruits, uh, pretty high in potassium. Um, and they're thinking, gee, what do I do? Uh, that's true of, of beans as well. So what are the low potassium foods? Um, there are a number of vegetables that are lower in potassium, the, the cruciferous vegetables, which are among your favorites. Um, kale and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, not so high in potassium compared with something like spinach or chard, which is pretty high. Um, and although many fruits are high, some are lower, like apples are fine and tasty and really don't have a whole lot of potassium in them. Uh, whereas you think of bananas as being loaded with potassium. Uh, in the, also in the vet vegetable department, asparagus pretty low. So if you go online um, or you consult with your dietitian, the dietitian will give you a list and say, here are all the low potassium foods, have at it. And one of the nice things about that is that some of the real staples like rice um, tend to be pretty low in potassium. So you fill up on the low potassium vegetables and fruits. Um, and make sure that you can, you can have rice, you can have pasta. Um, many refined breads are actually okay. And then you go from there and you, you do your best to, uh, to keep whatever kidney function you may have um, and to also make sure that your heart and your brain are being protected by a diet that will hopefully uh, prevent cardiovascular disease. Okay. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. It is really helpful. Um, actually, it, um, as, uh, we have another question that just came in um, from Dr. Uh, Steve Turner. Why don't endocrinologists recommend whole food plant-based diets to diabetics? Um, you know, is it, is it education? You know, what is it? Why don't most doctors recommend? Um, well, well, they should. It's the diet of choice. Um, and I think it's perhaps the same reason for why do doctors not really push patients to quit smoking? Um, and I got to tell you back, I mean, they do now. But back, here, here's my confession to you. In, <laughs> in 1984, I was a chief resident at George Washington University Hospital. And I would walk in the front door, go to the gift shop, plunk down my dollar bill and buy some merit menthols and light up on the way to the doctor's lounge. And yes, I did. And my head of surgery did the same thing, except he was smoking Marlboros. And we weren't stupid. We knew it caused cancer. But we were also under stress. We figured, well, you know, it takes time to get cancer. I'll quit eventually. And you know what? We were the worst when it came to advising patients to quit. We really didn't because we were kind of hooked ourselves and we didn't take it that seriously. But um, eventually, that, that was the year, the reason I mentioned 1984 was that the year, that was the year I decided enough is enough. I can't kid myself anymore. I must quit. And I did. And I never looked back. But a lot of people, when it comes to their diet, they can't quite imagine a breakfast without bacon in it and egg, without eggs and so they just haven't done it themselves. So they can't quite imagine it. They haven't bothered to read the research that the government paid us to do. Um, um, but for any doctors who are listening, um, our research has been published in Diabetes Care by the American Diabetes Association. It was funded by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, our longer term follow-up was in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And if you go on PubMed and you put in my name, you will see that and many other research uh, studies proving that this is a diet of choice. Um, and at the risk of making this even more long-winded, let me just tell you how we do the diet change. Can I just describe this real quick? Please do. Okay. Here, here's how you do it. Um, when the patient comes in, because the doctor thinks, oh, the patient will never do this. This isn't going to work. So why should I even recommend it? The patients will do it for sure. And here's how we have a clinic called the Barnard Medical Center. The patients come in, they're nervous. They don't know what to do, but they, they've got type 2 diabetes and they know that this is the place that's going to get them better. So what do I do, doc? Here's what I do. This takes, this takes me two and a half minutes. This is, this is my intervention. I sit down with a patient and I have an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. I draw an oval and I say, this is a muscle cell. 
and fat gets into your muscles. So I draw, I draw, what the thing that we were talking about in the presentation, I draw that for every patient. They got diabetes. And at the end of that presentation, they say, doc, you're saying that the fat in my cells is making my insulin not work and I can get the fat out by changing my diet. They say, yeah, exactly. They say, where do I start? How do I do this? I want to do it. So I say, okay, break it into two steps. Step one, take the next week and just think about vegan foods, the ones that you would actually eat. Breakfast, lunches, dinners that you would eat. You don't, have to, you don't have to go vegan. Just figure out the foods and write them down. I can do that. Fine. They come back a week later. This is step one. They come back a week, a week later. They got a list. Breakfast, oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins. Check. Um, I've got the, the veggie sausage. I bought, went to the store and I tried it. Check. In fact, I had my cornflakes with oat milk and rice milk. And I even tried the almond milk and it's all great. And for lunch, um, I had the veggie, um, veggie burger or the bean burrito or whatever. They got their list. Uh, my wife and I went to this Italian restaurant and they made the angel hair pasta with an arrabbiata sauce. They kept the oil really low. It was vegan. It was delicious. They gave me grilled asparagus with it. It's great. Doc, I'm ready. So then step two, so step one was to figure out the food. Step two is to go vegan for three weeks. And the patient says, oh, well, that's easy because three weeks is not very long. And I already figured out what I'm going to eat. So, okay, doc, I'll do it. And during the, that three-week period, you keep in touch every week because they're going to have a problem. Um, I went out to eat with friends and I wasn't sure what to eat or I was traveling or my, my friend made fun of me or something like that. You, 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 you walk through whatever the problems are. Once they get through the three-week point, their, their health will be completely different. They, they're losing weight, their blood sugar is coming down. And then in addition to that, their attitude about food has completely changed as well. So that's the way we do it. And then I always refer the patient to a dietitian who can sit down with them for an hour and make out their menu and go into much more detail. And then I have classes that they can take every week for free. And we have an app, um, which your patients can use for free. Um, it's called the um, 21 Day Vegan Kickstart app. It's on your iPhone, it's on your Android, 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. It's in Spanish, it's in English. Um, it's got menus, recipes, everything. So every single patient who comes in to see us, they leave ready to do this. And every doctor who ever comes through, we, we train doctors who they come through and medical students at GW. They all see, this is so easy. <laughs> and the, the patients love it. Because you know, the patients aren't so keen on filling a prescription. Yay, great, metformin, yippee. You know, I mean, they're not really your partner, but when, when you're talking about how to choose foods and you're really working out the issues with food selection, they've got power. They're, they're, they're a partner in the game and they love that part of it and all the side effects are good. So anyway, forgive me for that long-winded answer, but that's how we do it. I think that's, that's amazing. And, and I know that that's uh, something you talk about in the book. And yeah. I have to say, you mentioned the arabiata sauce the other day. So I decided as I was reading through the book, uh, and you mentioned it now that I'm like, oh, I've never had that before. And so I bought this um, seasoning packet that the d directions were in Italian. I don't speak <laughs> yeah. Italian. So somehow I um, translated, mistranslated a teaspoon of the sauce or of the, 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 um, the stuff for a tablespoon. Uh oh. And so I just want everyone to know if a, a teaspoon is plenty of Arabiata seasoning, because a tablespoon will put your tongue on fire. <laughs> well, Arabiata sounds like it's an Arab food. That's not it. Arabiata is Italian for angry. It means spicy. It means kind of devilishly spicy. <laughs> so yeah. And anyway, well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you had that learning experience. I did, and I will never, I will never do that yeah. again. Um, oh, funny. So I want to kind of move on to another topic that we taught that you talked about, um, and that was um, uh, when it comes to hormones. One of our uh, gals who is on uh, today, she had uh, Fabiola. Uh, she has a question specific to um, to thyroid, um, and I'm going to see if she wants to ask her question herself. Fabiola, if you want, I'm going to unmute you. Maybe. Hmm. I guess you need to unmute yourself. I'll just ask the question. Uh, let's see. Um, she has been uh, taking levothyroxine uh, for quite some time and 
has been uh, on a plant-based diet, will she need to take that levothyroxine forever? Um, there's no way of telling until you do the diet and then you talk with your endocrinologist. And what, what I would suggest you do is, well, first of all, hopefully you have an endocrinologist who can, uh, what the endocrinologist will do, of course, is to track your TSH level, thyroid stimulating hormone, because if that's high, that's a sign that it's really trying to push your thyroid gland to get it active. And if your thyroid gland is picking up its function and starting to normalize its work, the TSH level will start to drift down. So the doctor can follow that and will follow some other tests, of course, as well. So what normally we would do is, let's say you're taking thyroid hormone now, and you say to your doc, I'm gonna change my diet and I'd love to see how I do. And so you work out a deal where your doctor will back you off your thyroid hormone and just uh, see how your levels are as time goes on. There's, there's no danger in backing down slowly um, with your doctor watching over your shoulder. And it's entirely possible that you will not need it anymore. Uh, but you'll just have to find out. It's, it's exactly the same as with a person with diabetes. Um, in our research studies, the vast majority of people on insulin do have to go down on their insulin or stop it completely. And of course, they're thrilled um, about that. But you want to take it gradually and you want to work with your doctor to, to monitor your levels and then you set the medications accordingly. Okay. I think you're unmuted if you have an additional question. Yeah, hi. Um, yes, this is Fabiola. I, I have talked to my PCP and uh, several times and she said, no, you're going to be with the medication forever. So do you recommend for me to see like an uh, endocrinolo endocrinologist instead of the like, uh, primary physician? Yeah, it sounds like your doctor needs antidepressants. Um, <laughs> it, it sounds, like, sounds like your doctor's feeling kind of pessimistic about life. <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> you, you just can never tell. Um, you might also, bring, if you would like, bring your doctor a copy of your body in balance um, and, and show the thyroid chapter. Um, in the thyroid chapter, what you'll see, there's a case of a man, they're all real people, and I give their actual names. Um, there is a, a doctor named Mike, and he was the patient. He's um, a neurosurgeon in North Carolina, and he had a high TSH level, and he decided to try this diet, and his TSH started coming down, 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 and there, he had no requirement for medication at all after that. Um, but everybody's different. There, there's a case in the book of a woman who began thyroid replacement when she was in her late teens. And she was on it for decades. And, but she did what, I, what I'm describing now, which is she went on this healthy diet, talked with the doctor, the doctor backed her off her medications. She's got, she is now on no medications, has no bloods. Um, she's got more energy than she's had in years. So, but, but I always encourage people not to, not to cancel their doctor's appointments, but work with the doctor. And the doc, doctors are right to be skeptical. Um, and patients, patients are right to be skeptical because they, they, haven't, they haven't heard of people actually getting healthy. <laughs> but how, however, um, what doctors have to also recognize is there are certain conditions where it's okay to back down on medications uh, slowly and, and gradually. As an example, um, let's, say, uh, let's say you're on a statin for cholesterol. The doctor knows that it's okay to back you off your statin for a little bit um, and that you can always restart it. Where you can't do that is let's say a person's got really bad high blood pressure. You can't just take them off their antihypertensives because high blood pressure can kill you. Um, so doctors have to know which medicines they can back off and which ones they can't. And with the thyroid, they can work with you. This is, this, it is not rocket science. Thank you. Sure, good luck. And, you. And, and should you see an endocrinologist? Yeah, probably. So along the same line, uh, May has a, has a, a question. May, do you want to uh, talk about that or do you want me to ask the question? Oh, I can talk about that. Okay. Thank you. So um, probably about 12 years ago, I was diagnosed with grave disease. And of course, the, ear, uh, the, the eyes uh, um, became an issue. Um, so I received the, um, the ready, what, the, the, red, the radio, that, yeah, that I'm, uh, treatment. So probably about um, six years ago, I started a whole food plant-based uh, vegan diet. And I realized that um, my uh, thyroid, uh, my uh, synthroid dose um, has been dropped, gradually dropped from 120, 112 to now 50, uh, you know, uh, with the M MCG. So 
my question is, you know, I, I you know, I asked my physician to say, well, how, how how does that happen? Because um, I thought that you know, um, number one, um, my uh, my thyroid gland probably has been killed, and how could the dose be changed that uh, dramatically? You know, in six years. Right. Um, so that's the question: is, is how did this magic happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, keep in mind, we're, sort, we're, we're, we're still in early stages of understanding these things. But um, first of all, if your thyroid gland was totally destroyed by the uh, radioactive iodine that you've gotten, then you'll need to continue to take some, some Synthroid as well. But what's remarkable is that the, the large amount that you were taking before has been able to be drastically cut down by the diet change. Um, let me speculate with you as to why this could be. Um, part of the reason why diet change can help with thyroid function is that it affects the thyroid itself. Um, if a person has uh, antibodies that are attacking the thyroid tissue because of foods that they're eating cause these antibodies to form, and when you change the diet, the thyroid itself is liberated a little bit and it can freely make the hormone. And so in that case, people get healthier. That's true for both hypo and hyperthyroidism. However, what if foods also affect the target organ? In other words, the thyroid hormone comes out of the thyroid gland, it gets in the blood, and then it goes to the various organs of the body. And what if they become more sensitive to its effects as, as an example? That's what we see with insulin. Um, a vegan diet might cause the pancreas to make a little bit more insulin. We're not 100% sure, but there is, are some early indications that, that could be true. However, the, where the money really is, is in the end organ. The muscles and the liver become much more sensitive to the hormones effect. So what I'm saying now is really speculation as to, um, it could be the thyroid gland itself, which we know is affected by foods, um, but it could also perhaps be even the target organ. Thank you. Anyway, Thank but you. In, in any case, congratulations on the change that you made. I, I'm sure it's, it has impressed your, your own physician. Oh, yeah, thank you. I have a question coming from Kathleen. I'm gonna, Kathleen, I'm going to unmute you. There you Hello. go. Hi there. Hi there. Hi. Um, I have two questions. One kind of piggybacking on May's about um, if you actually, in my case, I had a goiter, I had my thyroid removed years and years ago. Um, I've been largely vegetarian my whole adult life, so I'm on low thyroid, but I definitely noticed that with the, the medication, um, well, ever since the thyroid was removed, it's really um, impacted my energy level, even with what they you know recommend and prescribe is level thyroxine slash synthroid. Um, um, so I, I don't think there's any hope because I don't have a thyroid of it regenerating or that ever changing. Um, so that's one question I have, if you can address that at all. You know, um, energy um, level, vegan diet. Yes. Um, what's your diet like now? Largely vegan, vegetarian. Uh, rarely I eat fish, okay. maybe an egg or two. Okay, uh, let's tackle two parts of this. Um, you're saying that your, your thyroid was destroyed be, as part of the treatment. Um, and now- Removed. You, <laughs> remo re removed, okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, and despite the fact that you're taking thyroid replacement, you don't really feel like you did before. You don't feel super healthy. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, there, there are two things that I would say. One is, um, and I'm sure you've been doing this already, but, but there's no substitute for playing around with the dose and the formulation um, with your endocrinologist. And, and many, many people with thyroid disease report exactly what you're saying is, I'm, I'm not right at the, the sweet spot yet. I don't really feel mm -hmm. that good. And so you work with your doctor to try to find um, that spot if you can. Um, it, it can be very frustrating because you feel like, oh, it's just, it, it, I don't have the, the, the energy that I, that I once had. But the other piece of this is to look at the, the uh, energizing effects of foods themselves. Yes. There was, there was an interesting study 
They came out earlier this year in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And what they did is they looked at people who had different kinds of meals. And then they looked at their energy later in the day. And they looked at their cognitive ability, meaning, you know, can I solve puzzles? Can I remember names and so forth? And what they found was that there was a, a trick that really helped people to get their energy back. And that was strict avoidance of saturated fat. Saturated fat is the fat that predominates in cheese. Uh, also, there's a fair amount of it in meat, some in chicken, um, and a lot of it in coconut oil and palm oil. And when you add those things to the diet, and you know, lots and lots of people add a lot of, the, a lot of that. They're having a grilled cheese sandwich for lunch, um, steak for dinner, and the saturated fat gets into the blood. And the, once it gets into the blood, it slows it's down the blood flow because it's very thick and viscous. And mm -hmm. it's, it seems to slow down the oxygenation of the brain. At least that's what we're speculating about that. But what we know for sure is that people feel really sluggish. And then you take those things out of the, the diet and people perk up again. So you might give that a try. But because what I just said sounds like it might be believable or maybe it's not true, maybe it applies to you, maybe it doesn't, what I would suggest you do is experiment with it. Mm -hmm. Take about a six week period. And during those six weeks, do this no animal products at all, keep the oils really, really low, mm -hmm. and eat foods as naturally as you can. Don't worry about the quantity. Eat till you're full, but have it be grains and beans and vegetables and fruits as natural as you can. Don't forget to take vitamin B12, which you need for healthy nerves, healthy blood. Uh, make sure your thyroid medication is where it ought to be uh, as much as you can. Get some exercise in there and just see what your body feels like when it's in its most natural relationship with food. Then if you want to, after six weeks, you can bring in the junk again and see if your, your energy level doesn't come down again. Um, yeah. For a lot of people, they are surprised. They're thinking, oh, this is how I'm supposed to feel. It's, it's a neat kind of thing to see. A lot of athletes do that because they need the endurance um, and they can't afford to, to be even a little bit sluggish. But um, you and I are athletes in our, in our own way, which we, we've got to make it, you know, to the car and get back home and do, you know, do the things that we need to do in everyday life. So give that a try and see if that doesn't affect things. My other question, thank you for that, um, is regarding, um, I think you may have touched on it, um, how your research has impacted um, mood, um, depression, anxiety, um, and even pain management. Yes. Um, is there a particular kind of pain we're talking about, if you don't mind my asking? Um, I'm not speaking so much for myself, but just, um, and, you know, for the people I've worked with. Okay. All right. Um, with regard to... Arthritis, for one. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, with arthritis, if we're talking about classic rheumatoid arthritis, it's an inflammatory condition, meaning mm -hmm. that if you look inside the joints, they're inflamed. They're specifically, they're, there's a membrane inside the joint called the synovial membrane. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, it's, it's angry looking. It's, 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 it's being inflamed. Why? Because in the same way as antibodies attack the thyroid gland, antibodies attack the synovial lining of the joints too. And years ago, this is, goes back, oh, maybe the 1990s, researchers in Scandinavia started doing studies where they would leave dairy products out of arthritis patients' diets. And they would go to completely vegan diets and found that not everybody gets better, but a lot do. So we started testing this diet. And it's amazing. It, it's, it, the, the effects are different for different people. But here's, here's what we do and here's what you can do if you, if you want to try it. For about four or five weeks, no animal products at all, keep oils low. You know, it's, it's the same kind of diet you'd use for a heart patient or person with diabetes. But now we're doing it for a different reason. We're, we're assuming that some food, some protein is being recognized by your body as some kind of invader. So your body is making antibodies to it as if it's a, as if it's a virus. Well, what, what foods are those likely to be? Dairy is number one, eggs, meat, those are very high on the list. You avoid all those things, see if you don't get better. If you do, great. If, you're, if you still have symptoms, then the step two is a little harder. We're gonna do a, a search and destroy to figure out which foods are causing the problem. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna eliminate all the foods that could be suspect. 
and we're gonna leave in the diet only those foods that I know cause pain and just about no one, like brown rice, cooked vegetables, relatively few other foods. You can eat a lot of them, but yes. we're, we're gonna eat only a limited range of foods. And for many people, their joints then calm down. Now, I bring the other foods back in one at a time to see if they trigger the pain. So, all right, I haven't had citrus fruits now for the next two days, you have a whole bunch of oranges. If it triggers pain, stop eating them. If it doesn't, you eat them. Uh, and then you bring in tomatoes and gluten and other things one at a time every two days. And I wrote about this in detail. I have a book called The Cheese Trap, you might have seen. Um, and in the back, in the appendix, I describe how to do this elimination diet. Um, and for people with rheumatoid arthritis, there are great medications for them that cost a fortune. Um, and if, if a diet change means that you don't need those medications, it's a, certainly a great thing to do. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen, sure. for yeah, the questions. Respect. I have a question. I'm um, going to kind of move on to our, another topic um, within the um, umbrella. Um, and this one actually comes from my mom. Um, my mom has actually been on Synthroid for quite a long time. And she said to me, she said, you know, hyperthyroidism is just something that happens as you get older. All of my friends have hypothyroidism. They're all on levothyroxine. And so I kind of thought, well, yeah, a lot of them are. And is that really the case? Um, I mean, obviously some younger people are, are diagnosed, but is it really something that women need to really be concerned about as we get older? Um, it's not the calendar that does it. Um, there are really two big reasons. First of all, it's a great question. And, there, and by the way, how are we doing for time? We have 31 minutes. Oh, you're kidding. Okay, great. All right. Um, there are two big reasons for running low in thyroid, and neither one of them is really age. Um, the first is, is, so, is a real simple one. It's a lack of iodine in your diet. Now, you, your, your, your thyroid gland can't make thyroid hormone without iodine. Um, and back in 1924, the Morton Company started selling these blue canisters with a girl in an umbrella, and it's called iodized salt. And so people were using salt, and they got all the iodine they needed, and there really wasn't very much iodine deficiency in the U.S. after that. Before that, there was a lot of it. But people started getting iodine, and people were pretty good. But what do we modern folks do now? We have sea salt, and we have kosher salt, and we have Himalayan salt. And they may not be iodized at all. And you go to a restaurant and they're not using iodized salt. Um, so you're just running low in iodine. And so doctors, they, they don't think that's possible because wait a minute, we haven't seen iodine deficiency around here in a long time. You're, you're, you can see it and it can, it can happen. Um, and doctors can, can diagnose it, but it's, it's a relatively easy thing to, to diagnose. Um, so, so that's number one, make sure you're getting iodine. And, and iodine, you can take it as iodized salt, so even a third of a teaspoon, half a teaspoon of salt in, in the course of a day, we'll give you some iodine. Sea vegetables, you know, I know people in Rochester, Minnesota are not so big on, on nori and wakame and arame. Um, because you can I grew, get it here though. But you can get it here. I grew up in Fargo. I know exactly the story. Right. Exactly. But, but it's, it, it's neat to, to bring them into your diet. But if you don't want to do any of that stuff, um, you can actually get um, thyroid, uh, I'm sorry, iodine supplements. Um, if you go online, some of them are just iodine, but some of them are, are kelp, K-E-L-P. It's, it's a sea vegetable, but they make this tiny little greenish pill um, that has a day supply of, of uh, iodine and that'll help. And it's, don't overdo it, don't underdo it, stick to the amount. Um, so, so that's number one. Um, number two, and this is actually a more common reason within the United States, because most people are getting iodine. If you're getting iodine, but you've still got thyroid, low thyroid, the biggest reason is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and that means the antibody attack. So something is causing your body to make antibodies, and your antibodies are there to destroy viruses and bacteria, and your body is making them because it thinks that there's a virus there. And why does it think that? Because something came in, and it could have been a protein from cheese um, or from the beef, uh, steak that you had the night before or something like that. Your body mistook it for an invader. And so it made these antibodies. If the antibodies attack the thyroid, you get low thyroid, Hashimoto's. If they attack the regulatory machinery, 
that controls the thyroid. Now the thyroid is uncontrolled and you can get hyperthyroid, that's Graves disease. So, but, but either way, it, it relates to an antibody attack. And um, just to, to finish off, at the Adventist Health Study 2, they brought in a huge group of people. Um, and they noticed that if people were vegan, they had very low risk of hypothyroidism, very low risk of hyperthyroidism. If they were meat eaters, they had a higher risk of hypothyroidism. If they were lacto-ovo vegetarians who were not eating meat but were making up for it with huge amounts of cheese and milk, they had the highest risk of hypothyroidism of all. And, but then when it came to hyper, the people who did the worst were uh, the omnivores, the people who were eating meat and eggs and dairy. Um, so th that's where we are. What we have not yet done, we, we do not have a randomized clinical trial, taking people where their thyroid is not so good and putting them on a vegan diet and seeing how many of them get better. We just really don't know. But no, if a person is low in thyroid, do not blame the calendar. Um, don't blame bad luck. Don't blame celestial intervention. Um, do look at iodine and look at uh, antibody uh, reactions and, and look at the antibodies that might be changeable based on food. Um, do see your doctor, don't cancel your doctor's appointment, um, but that there is no danger to a well-planned plant-based diet. Right, and Fabiola just uh, uh, added to the chat that she had been diagnosed with hyperthyroidism at age of 24, so yeah. case in point. Right, exactly. Oh, you know, it's, it happens all the time. And uh, one, one last thing. A, a <laughs> lot of people are marginal in their thyroid. Um, the doctor will say, well, I'd like to, again, your TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, if it's higher than a certain number, we're going to say it's working too hard. Your thyroid is not, it, your thyroid is sluggish. So a high TSH means you're hypothyroid. And so the cutoff, most doctors would say 4.0. Wait a minute. You're 3.8. You're 3.7, you're 3.5. Your thyroid may not be fully functional, even though you are in the what we're going to call the normal range. Right. Um, it's sort of like if you let's say your total cholesterol, the doctor wants it below 200, but you're 199. If you got it down to 148, would that be better? Yeah, it would be. Uh, it definitely would. Mm -hmm. So um, there are people who are marginal on thyroid. You treat them with thyroid a replacement; they do a lot better. But let's say we also look at why are you marginal? Is it the iodine? Is it an antibody reaction? Gotcha, thank you. So along these the lines with um, hypothyroidism and taking levothyroxine, um, and my like everyone has said to me, well, if you're on this medication, you should just stay away from soy, stay away from soy. Yet we know on a plant-based, whole food plant-based diet that soy products are really good for us. Right. So can you explain to me why doctors are telling people who are on this medication to avoid soy? Um, okay, well, the first thing that should be said is anything you eat, whether it's soy or anything else, should not be consumed at the time you take your medication. Um, because medica the, 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 absorb the absorption of the medication is impaired by food. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true of soy milk, and it's true of a McDonald's burger. <laughs> it's true of everything. Right. Don't, don't eat it. Take it on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, yeah, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that researchers have been looking at soy. And I have to say, the evidence of soy having any negative effect on thyroid is pretty meager. Um, it's getting so far a not guilty verdict. Now, uh, let, me, let me add a note of um, uncertainty about that because there, I don't think people have looked enough to really know, um, but, the, but, but we certainly don't have enough evidence to, to condemn soy at all. And I, I, I would not encourage anyone to avoid soy based on, on thyroid. Um, the, the bigger reason why people mistakenly avoid soy is because they, they hear that it has estrogens in it. Um, and let me just say a word about that. Um, the, the fear was that soy has what are called isoflavones that could attach to your estrogen receptor. But the amazing thing is that when you do the studies, and there have now been about 45 different studies or maybe more, of women who consume a little soy or a lot of soy or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that the women who consume the most soy, uh, soy milk, uh, tofu, soy yogurt, whatever, uh, the women who consume the most soy have the lowest risk of breast cancer. 
Um, so, so soy doesn't cause breast cancer. It, it seems to reduce the risk, maybe about 30% reduction in risk for those consuming the most. And women previously diagnosed with breast cancer who consume the most soy, they have the lowest risk of dying of their cancer. So soy is protective. It reduces it re reduce the risk of breast cancer, reduces the risk of dying of a pre-existing breast cancer. And for men, it reduces the risk of prostate, prostate cancer, all roughly in about that sort of that 30% range. Um, so you don't have to have soy, totally, totally optional, but um, it's a cancer preventive. It, and it, you know, it, 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 it's so versatile. You can make soy sausage, you can make soy bacon, soy cheese. One day they'll make snow tires out of it. It's amazing, <laughs> the stuff that you can make out of soy. So. <laughs> well, we do need those uh, here in Minnesota. As yeah, you, you know. sure do. <laughs> Don't I know it. So since we're talking soy, I'm going to go just to the next thing from soy, soy milk to um, actual regular milk. We talked about a, li a little bit about this. Um, and the questions, there are three of them. Let me just quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is basically about, uh, it's would dairy cause or worsen leaky gut syndrome? <laughs> yes, it could. Um, I, I, I guess if I were sitting down with the person who asked the question, I, I would ask them how they know they have leaky gut and, and, and that kind of stuff. The reason I say that is that your gut may or may not be leaky. Um, it may well be that certain things that you're eating are, are problematic for your health in any case, even, even if the gut isn't really leaking through. But, but it could be, um, it, it certainly could be, and, and dairy is one of the things that you wanna get away from um, in any case. Um, even if you don't have a leaky gut, the, there are some, a lot of things in dairy products that you don't want in your body. The main nutrient in milk is sugar. That, that's its number one nutrient. I know that sounds surprising, but Mother Nature invented milk, if I, if I can put it this way, with the idea of what can I make, what can I give to a calf that's going to make that calf get fat quickly? So Mother Nature made milk with sugar as the number one ingredient. It's, it's, it's um, not table sugar, it's lactose. So lactose is the main ingredient. And then the next big ingredient is fat. Okay, we're going to fatten that, that, little, that little calf up. So a lot of fat goes in there and unfortunately, the lactose sugar will cause a bellyache. And it breaks down in your digestive tract, if you can digest it, to release galactose, which can be, we believe, toxic to the ovary. The fat is really high in saturated fat. That's the worst kind. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind that's linked to uh, heart disease, to uh, potentially Alzheimer's disease and others. And then the protein, the protein is the one that we've been concerned about as for triggering the autoimmune effects. Now, we need more research on all these areas, but we are way past the point of realizing that dairy products really are great for the calf. And beyond that, beyond that, I gotta tell you, beyond that, it's all marketing. It, it's, it really has nothing. You, you do need calcium, but uh, you get calcium the same place the cow got calcium, which is green vegetables. Cows, mm -hmm. cows have grass, you have broccoli, but uh, green vegetables, that's where calcium comes from. So basically, there's other two questions. I'm just going to kind of summarize that. Um, dairy bad. <laughs> um, I like this one. Um, so I just have to ask it because it, it's kind of fun. Um, how would dairy affect male menopause? <laughs> um, I'm assuming that that question is more about, you know, is more focused men than women. Um, and actually, to, to add to that question, uh, somebody just asked me on the chat, uh, speaking of men, so we're talking men and dairy, but also men and soy. The question is, is there too much estrogen for men? So. Yeah, okay. Um, well, first of all, I'm not really 100% sure that there is exactly such a thing as male menopause. Um, if, now maybe I'm wrong with this, but um, if what the person is referring to is a reduction in testosterone as time has gone on, um, let me challenge that a little bit. Um, I did write about that in Your Body and Balance in some detail. And I gotta tell you, there are, it's always a, a troubling thing when, when you're trying to do good research and then there's some commercial product out there that's, that's trying to make a name for itself and it confuses men. And right now the, the, the disease du jour is low T. So the, the guy goes to the doc and says, doc, I'm gaining weight. I got no energy. 
I think maybe I'm low in testosterone. And the doctor can do blood tests and can kind of sort out the testosterone level and administer testosterone to the guy. By and large, you're not on a winning track there. You're not going to resolve the guy's problems. Now, this doesn't mean he, he doesn't have issues. He does. But in so many of these cases, the issue is the guy has gained weight over time. His body fat cells, the, the, the fat cells in your abdomen or on your thighs, those fat cells aren't just bags of calories. They're factories. They take his testosterone as a raw material and they turn it into estrogen in his body. So if I'm going to give him testosterone pills uh, or some, some kind of testosterone medication, but I'm not helping him lose weight, then his testosterone is getting processed into female sex hormones by his body fat. Okay, let's stop. Let's help him to try a, a vegan diet. You got to convince him that it's a macho thing to do. You have to tell him that bulls are vegan. You know, <laughs> stallion is vegan. You know, the biggest elephant is the vegan. Okay, so all right, good, I'll try it. Um, and what you discover is he starts losing weight. And as he's shedding that body fat, he no longer has those factories that are taking his testosterone and converting it into, into estrogens. Um, the other thing is that when he's on a healthier diet, he will have more energy anyway. Um, remember what I was saying earlier about getting the saturated fat out of your diet, your energy just starts to come back. So he'll feel more like himself. Um, his erectile dysfunction, if he's got that, is more likely to go away or, or, or improve. So he'll feel like he's getting his testosterone back, when in fact, he's just getting his overall health back, really. His overall health back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm, I have a question that just popped up. Okay. Okay, this question is from JND Thompson. Um, after menopause, what can women do about dry, dry skin and um, dry and vaginal atrophy? Okay, um, this is. Let's talk about medications for that. Um, this is one area where I think medications can be used, but but I would use them in a particular way. And I, I do have a section. Again, not, let me again refer you to my book just so that you have more information about it, because I do have a whole section on how on sexual symptoms after menopause and, and how to handle it in a smart way. But here's what's gonna happen. You go to the doctor and you say, doc, I've, uh, I've got hot flashes and I've got vaginal dryness and itching. And, and if we have intercourse, it, 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 I, it's, it's not good. It hurts. Uh, I don't wanna do this. And so the doctor can give you some um, estrogen pills, which you take and your hot flashes will go away. But then you read an article that says, this causes breast cancer and you think, okay, I feel kind of better, but I sure don't want to have breast cancer. But I, you stick with it for a while. And after about two years, your doctor says, you know, you can't keep taking those pills. You say, why not? Because they cause breast cancer. You say, well, why have you been prescribing them all? Said, well, I told you it was just for a little while, da, 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 da. So then you stop taking them and all your symptoms come, come right back. The hot flashes come again. You say, well, what am I going to do? You know, there, there's got to be some solution here. Um, here's, here's the way I would do it. I would, for, with regard to hot flashes and so forth, you can just put up with them if you want to. You can use the soy supplements as we were talking about earlier, and that will, that will often help. With regard to vaginal dryness, I am not really convinced that soy or other um, dietary supplements really help. But um, if you are using an estrogen product, what I would use is I would not use Premarin, um, which is a very popular one because it's horse derived. It pre the words Premarin are short for pregnant mare's urine. But it, so it's, it's, that's where, what it's from. It's distilled out of the urine of horses. And it's very popular because it's heavily marketed. But if it were me, I would use any other product other than that because all the rest are botanically derived. But instead of using it as an oral medication that affects your whole body, including the breasts, what you would do instead is use it just as a local ointment. And so you just use it locally and that's it. Um, don't use it immediately before intercourse. It's, it's not used as a sexual lubricant. Use it as a medication. And then day after day, it will cause those tissues to recover their health. Um, let's say you have not had intercourse for 12 years because um, at, after menopause, things are really hurting and, and you just, 
gave up on it and you decided, okay, now I'm remarried or whatever, and you want to see if you can awaken that part of your, your existence, um, go see your gynecologist. You can use local estrogen creams if you want to, and there are a whole host of new, really simple treatments that will tone up the vaginal lining um, and are really quite safe um, that, 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 that doctors can use. The reason that I'm making a pitch for that is I'm concerned about the, the sort of 1980s approach, which was all women were being used as funnels for oral estrogens. And, um, and that to me is, 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 is really not the way I would recommend going. Thank you. Sure. There's a question from uh, Dr. Bouchard here, and um, I, there are two questions here um, that I think would be really good in, in, in closing. Um, we have about uh, 13 minutes. The first, so uh, Dr. Bouchard is a primary care doctor, and she asked, how can I best start the conversation about the benefits of whole food plant-based diet with my patients, especially that those who are resistant We've talked, we know all of this, we know the science, it's all good stuff, but how do you start the conversation? And especially with those people, and I know them, I live with them sometimes. <laughs> yeah. They're so resistant uh, to that change. Um, well, first, first of all, it's a great question. It's a wonderful question from a primary care doc as well. Um, this, it's important to remember that everyone is resistant to change. Um, we were, at one point in life, we were all that, 18 month old baby who was biting the spoon, you know, in our sitting in our high chair. Um, we, we have opinions about food that, that we are formed very, very early. So everyone is resistant to change. And that's okay, that's good. Because if we, if we didn't have opinions about food, we would just follow any goofy fad. So that's built in. We're all kind of conservative when it comes to diet. So we accept that we don't need to challenge it at all. And we don't need to challenge our patient's skepticism. What I normally do, is I will ask the patient or individual, um, what would you like to fix? Like, why are you here? You know, what's your primary complaint? And so they'll say, well, my diabetes, you know, I'd, I'd like you to manage my diabetes, whatever. At some point, I will then say, um, can I describe to you the cause of type 2 diabetes? And that's when I take out my 8 and a half by 11 sheet of paper and I should draw the oval circle, the, 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 the muscle cell, and I walk them through the cause of, of it. And they'll say, no, doc, is it, no doctor's ever showed me that before. And then I, and, um, or why do we have a high cholesterol level? Well, and you, you explain that animal products have saturated fat and cholesterol that drive your cholesterol level up. You explain this, but you, you're not signing them up for a new religion um, or anything. You're just explaining how the biology works. And then you're asking, would you like to try a change with me? Now, different doctors do it differently. There are some who try multiple small changes. I do not do that, and I don't believe in it because I want that patient to experience wellness fast. And the way they'll do it is by making a big diet change, but they do it for a really short time so it's manageable. Like I could do anything for three weeks. So I say, okay, I'm, you know, and, and that's when I go through the sequence that I described earlier. The step one, try the vegan foods for a week. Step two, actually eat them for the next three weeks. And, um, that usually works really well. Um, it does pay to have a good registered dietitian that you work with. In my clinic, I have four of them. And so, and, and I only hire vegan dietitians. <laughs> so, so everybody who works there knows, they, they can answer questions. So if they're not, if they haven't ever done that diet, I have to say that they don't know how to, you know, gee, you know, if you're on the road, if you're on the highway, I don't know what I'd eat. You know, you need somebody who can answer their questions. Um, but if you do that, it works so great. One other thing I will just mention real quick. Sometimes we do telemedicine at my medical center, the Barnard Medical Center. We do telemedicine visits. And very often the patients are, they have their own doctor, but the doctor wants them to consult with us for two visits or three visits and to get them on a better path. And that's something you can, also, you can always do as well if you want. I love that. That's really, really a great option for people. Yeah. Um, wow. So just um, last question um, before we close, and this is, um, I think May sent this. The CDC director warns America is in for the worst fall we've ever had. What are your suggestions for, for healthcare providers and the general public on how to prepare for whatever is about to come this fall and winter? Yeah, well, what the CDC director was talking about is COVID-19. Um, when this 
virus emerged in China, one of the things that was very clear was that for some people, it's the flu. You get sick, you recover. For others, it will kill you. And the difference in many cases is obesity or diabetes and possibly hypertension, um, pre-existing lung disease, pre-existing heart disease. And when, it, when a person comes into any hospital now, the docs know right away who you're gonna, who's gonna end up on the ventilator and who you're never gonna get off the ventilator. It's the really overweight person with bad diabetes. That's a person who you just know this virus is gonna hurt them. Um, why? Uh, we're learning why. Uh, part of the reason is that the ACE2 enzyme, the angiotensin converting enzyme, um, it's, it's a welcome mat for the virus. You, the virus, you inhale the virus. It's looking for that, for that ACE2 enzyme, uh, which happens to be on the surface of fat cells. Um, it enters the body in that way. Um, and the more body fat you have, the more welcoming your body is to, to the coronavirus. Um, in China, when the virus emerged, people with type 2 diabetes in good control had a 1% mortality. People with, type, with, with diabetes in poor control had an 11% mortality. So what do you do? The virus is coming down the pike. You've got type 2 diabetes. Now you go vegan, very low fat. Your control starts improving day by day by day by day. The, the DASH study back in 1997, which was for hypertension, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, it's sort of a semi-vegan diet. It's more vegetables, more fruits, less meat, less fat. Um, within two weeks, it lowered blood pressure. So this fall is gonna be terrible. It, there's no way around it. Step one, wear your mask, good hygiene, social distancing, yes, absolutely. But you need more than that. And that's eat in such a way that diabetes and obesity and hypertension are controlled as well as they possibly can be. And, and, you, and, and that means really promoting a plant-based diet as, as loudly and clearly as we can. And for people who say, who would do that? It's, it's too far reaching. Wait a minute, look what you're doing now. You're, you're staying home all the time. You're not even going to work. <laughs> you know, um, People are making such huge changes in their life that the idea of switching from meat sauce to to tomato sauce and your pasta, that's a pretty small change. Um, so if we can do those things, then if the virus comes, we are much less likely to die of it, much more likely to survive. This is obviously important for elderly people, but frankly, it's important for everybody. You know, we wanna make ourselves as strong as we can. So, so yes, my, my answer is we've gotta fight this virus as hard as we can, and that means um, be on, on the diet that tackles diabetes, that tackles obesity, that tackles hypertension. Mm -hmm. uh, on that note, I know you have a class on reversing diabetes that's gonna be coming up in September. Would you just quickly uh, tell us a little bit about it and how uh, those people who are interested can um, register? Oh, well, thank you for asking about that. Um, yes, I actually only just heard today that this is actually been scheduled as it's gonna happen. But yes, um, we, we decided that there, there's so many people who wanted a little extra help. So we have launched a new webinar series um, for people with type two diabetes. And it's just what we've been talking about, um, but week by week um, over a three week period, we will give people guidance. We'll walk them through every step on how to do it. We'll have details on our website, which is PCRM. Dot org. You'll see information there on, on how to sign up. And I hope people will maybe grab a hold of somebody they love and say, honey, let's do this together. Um, it'll, it'll be a fun adventure for both of you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think um, yeah. it's really one of those things that we, everyone knows someone in their life who needs a little bit of help. And I think um, inviting someone to uh, on the journey with you is always really helpful. You, know, you don't you don't have to make a long-term commitment you just go go together and see what happens if you like it you stick with it there we go i love it dr barnard thank you so much thank you everyone for uh participating being here and um uh, participating thank you for the questions um oh i one just popped on and i do it is actually i think an important one so if you okay. don't mind dr okay. barnard real quick um can you please quickly define what you consider low fat by percentage of intake or grams? What a sophisticated audience you have. Good heavens. 
Um, well, for, I'll give you the numbers, but before I do, um, let me encourage you not to, you don't really have to count and you don't even have to write down this number. And, and the reason I say that is all you really need to do is if you're not eating animal products, then you're not getting any animal fat at all. So that takes that out of the equation. Um, and if you keep, if you're not adding oils as you're cooking, so you have a good nonstick pan and you have all my non, my low fat techniques, you're not really adding oils. And if you're also avoiding the foods that are naturally pretty oily, there aren't many of them, but uh, nuts and, and nut butters like peanut butter, avocados, um, oily salad dressings, that's about it. Okay, so let's say I'm not eating any of that, but you're eating beans and vegetables and fruits and whole grains in whatever abundance you want, then that's my definition of low fat. If you did the numbers, it would turn out to be about 10% of your energy would come from fat, uh, something like that. And, and you'd need some fats. Um, if you send a sprig of spinach to a laboratory, they would tell you that maybe uh, seven or eight or 9% of its calories actually are fat. That's good. You, your body needs those traces. Um, in terms of grams, if you squeezed all the fat out of all your spinach and beans and carrots and things and, and added it all up, it would end up being about 30 grams a day. That's really low compared to what other people are eating, uh, but it's more than enough for health. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to answer My that pleasure. question. My pleasure. I think that was really important. So again, thank you, Dr. Bornar. This has been fabulous. This has truly been a treat for me uh, and I'm sure for everyone who has participated today. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thanks to all my friends there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope, you, to, so I hope, I hope you. to come back. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you.